Uh, it was a remarkable thing. The, our planet was created out of the debris of a supernova explosion. When the supernova explosion occurred, uh, what happens is stars, very big stars, start with hydrogen in the early universe. That's all you've got, hydrogen and a little bit of helium. You get these big stars made of hydrogen. And they start cooking up the elements inside. And eventually they get to iron. They get this little nugget like a Tootsie Roll pop of iron sitting in the middle of the star. You can't fuse iron. It doesn't produce energy by fusion. Well, it's, no, it just stops. The fusion stops there. And the process continues outside, but eventually the star runs out of gas. When it runs out of gas, it starts to collapse because it's so heavy and massive. Okay, and it starts to squeeze. Now, if it didn't do that, you'd have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the elements below iron stuck inside stars, and the world would, the universe would kind of come to a big thud end point. That would be it. We wouldn't exist. But fortunately, this thing starts to collapse. And that little iron Tootsie Roll Pop center gets squeezed. By the way, that little iron Tootsie Roll Pop is about one and a half times the mass of the sun. This thing is a 50 solar mass star. It squeezes iron. So the whole iron ball has the density of an atomic nucleus. And now protons, electrons, and neutrons are squeezed on top of each other. Now there's a, a weak interaction called beta decay by which a neutron decays to a proton plus an electron plus a, an antineutrino. And we know this. It's one of the things we study here. Neutron can go to proton plus electron plus antineutrino. You can cross this reaction. And you can take a neutron plus a proton plus an electron. And you get out. Uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, I just do it this way. Goes to neutron. Okay, I can put the neutron on the other side of the equation. Uh, so that's what happens. You've got all these neutrons in the iron. The protons and electrons get squeezed on top of each other, and they have electric charge. So they're repelling each other, but they're also attracting. Protons are attracting the electrons, but they're repelling other protons. Electrons are repelling other electrons. And it's, it's not energy efficient to have the protons and electrons anymore. And the gravity doesn't care. It just keeps squeezing. So this process happens very, very quickly. All the protons and electrons combine, making neutral neutrons. And a blast of neutrinos comes out. That blast of neutr neutrinos are very evanescent particles. They go through matter, normal density matter. They easily, we send them from Fermi Lab up to Minnesota, and very few of them interact. And billions and billions, and not, not a darn one of them interacts. OK. However, this star is so massive that those neutrinos can't get out. And they just blow the whole star to smithereens. What's usually left behind is a neutron star. It's the leftover iron core. It's usually spinning. They've been discovered. But all this debris is blown out into space. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you know, aluminum, silicon, lots of silicon. That last moment, there was no uranium because it's heavier than iron until this happens. When this happens, a lot of neutrons get blown out and they sort of bathe all the matter with neutrons. And that makes all the heavier junk, trace amounts of it, stuff heavier than iron, makes uranium. It makes equal amounts of all the higher isotopes, U-238, U-235, and the two main interesting ones. There's also U-233. Well, if there's only trace amounts, that must be some star, because there's a lot of uranium. Not compared to aluminum and silicon and oxygen and carbon. There's very little uranium compared to the rest. OK, so you get what I mean by trace amount is in ratio. So the uranium, that sets the clock. Now the half-life of U-238 is, is several billion years. The half-life of U-235, which is the stuff that you make bombs and reactors out of, is only 700,000 years. So immediately, the U-235 starts fading away with a half-life of only 700,000 years. The U-238 fades away with a half-life of several billion years, so it fades more slowly. So by the time, a few billion years later, this cloud of debris reforms a new star, a yellow star. It's got a lot of metals in it, our sun. And junk going around it forms planets that now have rocks. 
and they have and have oxygen and, and stuff. So now stuff can really start getting cooked. It's more interesting, like Bach cantatas can be cooked. And, you know, if you like the group Seeger ones, they can exist now. So all this stuff starts to happen. And we can go and dig up uranium. And we find that the U-235 is now down around less than 1% of U-238. We can measure exactly how much there is. We can work backward and figure out when the supernova bloomed. It was about six billion years ago. Now, if you get more than 3% of U-235, you can build a reactor. That's why they have to build all these centrifuges and concentrate it. To make a bomb, you need 97% U-235. It's really enriched. Weapons grade is, is a lot of enrichment. But reactor grade is a little bit of enrichment. That's why we get so suspicious when we see a country centrifuging like hell, because they're making lots and lots of pure U-235. They don't have to do that to build a reactor. So you, uh, if you have more than 3% U-235, you can make a reactor. Two billion years ago, that was how much U-235 there was on Earth. Earth had about 3% U-235. So, if you look around Earth, you find geological formations, in particular in West Africa, in Gabon, a little place called Oklo, there are mines that are two billion years old. I mean, the, in, in material, it's two billion years old. And what do you find? you find the remains of naturally occurring nuclear reactors. Water will concentrate minerals, like it always does, making mine shafts. It concentrated U-235 <laughs> together, because it was more abundant, and it started a chain reaction. And it turned the, the rock, the silicon, around it into quartz glass. So you're digging a mine shaft, and all of a sudden, you're in a big glass environment with quartz, and you see all these incredibly evidence of energetic processes. And the reactor would run for half a million years, then it would shut itself off. More water would flow in, bringing in more use, then it would turn on again. These things turned on and off over periods of about 20 or 30 million years. There were like 14 of them found. Three of them are preserved for scientific study, and the rest, they let the miners have the minerals. So what is remarkable about this is that when you dig up the junk inside of a dead reactor that lived two billion years ago. There's lots of junk there that only reactors can make. Some of these elements, like strontium-90, and there's another one whose name is in our book, uh, is only made. It's not made in the supernova at all. It's only made by nuclear reactors, and we find it there. And we find exactly the right amount. And if you were to change the value of the electron charge by one part in about 10 to the 11, one part in 100 trillion, from its current value, you wouldn't make any of this stuff. It's so sensitive to the values of the coupling constants, the values of the basic parameters of physics. And yet, these two billion year old reactors have exactly the right amount. That tells us that the laws of physics are incredibly stable over a period that's comparable to the age of the universe. Two billion years isn't quite 13, but it's, you know, 15% uh, of the age of the universe. The laws of physics aren't changing by one part in 10 to the 11. If you read some articles about astronomers claiming to see one part in 10 to the 7 changes the electric charge in distant clouds of gas, you have a problem because that flies in the face of the Oklo results. And it flies in the face of, of lots of data. So I just wanted to give you that little as you were asking me, that that is, in fact, uh, we now know there's lots of experimental evidence about the stability of the laws of physics.